So we're going to have Gary now, who's going to moderate this. Moderate. A special role. <laughs> that includes me. Uh, so we're going to have questions. We've got about 20, 25 minutes or something like that. So we've got a little bit of time. I'm filling in now because every time everyone says, anyone got any questions, there's about two minutes of quietness where everyone looks at their shoes uh, and they get into the, the swing of it. Um, I'm kind of been really bad that we missed an opportunity. I mean, I thought calling it the Centre for Disruptive Media was was kind of interesting in things, but if it had been the, the Centre for per Perverted Miniature Circuses, that would, been, <laughs> that would have been fantastic. I mean, it's what we're all doing, isn't it? We're all constructing a perverted miniature circus. So that would have been fantastic. So any, any questions? Can I just start going back to one of the points that... Um, oh, we have a mic. Thank you very much. Start by going back to one of the points that Craig finished on, which is, yeah, which is about you know, your audience and who's going to... A bit louder. Who's, it for? who's, it, who's going to read it? Um, yeah. Because I think that's quite important in terms of multimodal or you know, whatever your output is, or how, you know, whatever you... Whatever, however you produce your work, however you publish it. Um, I mean, within the arts, the world that I come from, everything starts with your audience mm -hmm. and then um, it gets driven from there. So I just wanted to kind of throw that back to you guys in terms of um, in, in terms of the content, the kind of publishing that you're involved in and, and how you see your readership. Yeah, I can answer that. Oh, yeah, I was interested in, in, uh, in what Craig was saying about that as well and, and wanting to know about what, what were the changes in reading um, that led to, you know, reader-led <laughs> changes. So it's a little, you know, it, it's kind of like what the, the, the kind of, the mechanics of that, the, um, the differentiations among that, would you say that the, you know, the readership changes in a differentiated way, the older readers are more, you know, kind of died in the wall academics, they're going to just want things the way they are, thank you very much. Um, you know, there's, there's a lot of debate around that. And I guess the only other note, of course, I mean, I, you know, <laughs> not kind of closing down the answer, but I, I always think about um, the way which, when we go back to critical theory, for example, with all that writing about writing and reading that happened with Bart and Foucault and Derrida, um, um, you know, I, I do this work a lot with my students, and then I, you kind of watch what happens. What happens is the shift happens between authors and readers, um, and there's there's this kind of very really clunky um, understanding of agency there that I I would want to be a little bit cautious about. You know, the power what's here, and now the power is over here. Does that really what happens? Um. Go on, Craig, you, you're fine. Okay, good. I, you, you'll have to support me. Uh, how can I get this to Mac, though? We don't know. It's, it's a little disconcerting because everything I'm saying has a, an echo, but it's okay. So I, I want to give two answers to that. The first is that uh, in terms of the Folk Vine project, we had multiple audiences. Uh, if you think back to that first slide or that first image that was... Uh, playing in a very unusual way, but anyway, it was about how a messages for child abuse need to reach a different audience uh, depending on what the, uh, the message has got to be different depending on the audience. Um, and so in Folk Vine, uh, we had to reach uh, distinct audiences. The first audience was the state was funding us. Uh, and I know that in the UK, you're dealing with this as well, is that the state cares a lot about um, making sure that their messages, uh, their funding uh, is not um, taken in a, in, in a re direction that, that, that would be displeasurable to the public. So we had to deal with that. We had, and their mandate was, quote, make it accessible to the public. So to do that, what we did is we would show rough drafts of each of the segments of our website, um, each artist, and we would do that in, a, in the at a big giant event. Uh, so for example, we had a huge hula uh, dance and event with food and performances and hula dancing and uh, ukulele playing. Uh, when we talked about uh, the um, quilt maker and then we would take that information and we would try to modify the messages. So the, the notion of interaction uh, is one one aspect of this notion of reading. Yes, I 
Now, the second answer is that I'm, I'm now interested in, in uh, looking at uh, a, an avant-garde reading machine from the 1930s and uh, late 20s. Uh, that Gertrude Stein and Marcel Duchamp all participated in. Um, and uh, that project is more along the lines of that notion of the critical theory. But it, it, it might have to do with a rethinking of reading as a kind of mechanical process. So what I'm interested in is a kind of, I don't know, a, a, the visceralness, the, 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 the bodiliness, the the erotics of reading itself as a physical activity um, rather than literacy. Um, so much of my work in terms of reading is to sort of rethink reading away from, away from literacy. And I'm in a department, I, I think you might have mentioned this at the very beginning, I'm in a department which is a doctoral program in literacy. Uh, so there's a kind of challenge there as well. I don't know if that, that just is the beginning of the answer, obviously. I've been thinking about this for a bunch of years. Andre? Um, yeah, thanks. Um, <clears throat> what I have to say is uh, has something to do with uh, two understandings of openness. Um, so one understanding has something to do with numbers. Um, and it's quite fascinating to think about, to relate back to the Sum is Dot stories that uh, some of these books that were just incredibly difficult to produce and multiply and distribute um, sold you know, in, the, in the thousands or tens of thousands. And now we're happy when we sell you know, five, six, seven hundred copies of our academic books. Uh, and one argument for open access publishing is that it makes our works um, more accessible, so accessible to a wider audience. And I think that this is a compelling argument, <clears throat> but I would like to argue for a different understanding of openness, not something that works on the level of numbers, but something that, um, that relates to um, what in the paper version of my talk I call some is that worlds, so basically, um, these spaces that are created around specific texts. So I think what is really interesting if you open up uh, the process of reading, and I think this resonates well also with, with what Craig just said, um, if you open up the process of reading, then you're able to think about the audience as um, members of a, of a world centered around a book or particular texts. Um, which is more of an ongoing process, not just an, a one-off exchange. You buy the book, you read it, and then it's over. Yeah, can I just... Uh, that notion of openness, um, I, I like that a lot. I'm going to think about that. That there's two opennesses. You know, one is an openness of numbers, but then there's this other openness. I really like that idea. Thanks. All the scholarship we've talked about has uh, depended on publishing and printing. What about oral scholarship? How do we capture all of that analysis and knowledge and scholarship that isn't printed and promoted in traditional means or digital means? I was working obviously with folklorists and we dealt with oral cultural traditions and all of I don't really see a divide, much like Sarah talked about. I don't really see a divide, or Johanna Drucker talked about in that review. Um, I don't see a huge divide between the digital and the oral cultural traditions. Rather, we looked at it as a way of sharing that oral cultural traditions. We would go to these events and film them. Yes, you're seeing a video of those things, but we're we're trying to break down the raw the 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 barrier between um, oral cultural traditions and uh, print media. Uh, again, I, I think publishing is long ago doesn't really necessarily just need print is sort of a major point of my my argument here. And that specifically it doesn't it hurts when you're de dealing with something like oral cultures, like uh, painters, like sound artists, etc. Those all benefit from being able to publish those in a different form. So I, yeah, I mean, I, hopefully it's clear that what I'm saying is the PDF is limited. 
uh, that doesn't seem to be the only way to do digital work. Um, okay, so um, to give a, a very specific um, example or uh, answer to your question, one of the books that will uh, be published by Mettering Press, hopefully in the end of this year, is about Baroque complexity um, as opposed to Romantic complexity. So it will be about the Baroque very uh, um, widely or, or, or broadly defined. Um, and what we're planning to do is that there will be a, a, a series of essays, so very more or less conventional. Um, but then there's going to be a corresponding website with all kinds of things, uh, including Baroque music. So for me, the question is um, a, a less, um, you know, is it possible to create space for non-textual non or non-print material? For me, the real question is how do we create space for it so that this material is not just an illustration, uh, so it's not something that you can refer to in a text. You know, if you're interested in listening to this part of Bach's uh, whatever piece, then go to this website. But more to create a space in which uh, they can be appreciated on their own terms. Um, I don't have an answer to this, but I think that this is it's important to to keep this problem in the foreground. So thanks, I really appreciate your question. I, I think certainly, yeah, there's a, there's a difference, isn't there, between trying to open out the possibilities for conversation and listening um, uh, and something else which has to do with tradition, which has to do with a notion of fixity and originality uh, um, and authenticity that, you know, we're kind of probably uh, advised is necessarily contingent. You know, this is where well, probably I would recommend we all reread the order of things probably on a <laughs> weekly basis because here we realize that there wasn't a humanities in the 17th and 18th century. It came about as a kind of division from the social sciences in the 19th century. So the, you know, and there's always uh, inherent within these apparent fixities, these apparent kind of authentic places, something moving, something vital, something experimental. So there isn't, for me, a kind of a go-to place that needs to be properly represented or properly. It's without, without any kind of disrespect to work that tries to respect different voices and different modalities, I think that's a different question for me. Um, you know, it's this notion that there's a kind of place, uh, an original point or an authentic place to go that solves, uh, somehow solves the problem. I don't think the problem is solvable in that way, it, it has to be. It has to be mess, messier than that. It's dirtier than that. It's. It's. You know. Uh, um, it deals necessarily with the things that are happening to it, and part of what's happening to us is something very specific around marketization rather than digitization. I think. Can I? Can I? Um, so I, I, I want to pick up on that as well. I actually agree with that. And I, I want to do that by pointing to a failure in our Folkvine project, or not a failure, but one of those times when we actually thought about what are we going to do in terms of our audience. So I mentioned to you the, um, the perversion of the miniature uh, circus maker. And I want to come back to that because when we went to interview him, there was some... Um, paraphernalia and uh, items that were um, part of a gay subculture, let's say. But, but he didn't want that as necessarily part of his legacy. He wanted it to be about the circus. So we had long conversations about, about that. Is what, is, what is the difference between doing a, a study about this person and doing community-based uh, work? So in that sense, we, we d didn't know what we decided to do was to not include that. That would be a different kind of a study. Um, and it, it might have humanized him because the circus culture is, is very, very odd and very contentious, and especially in the United States. I, I don't know if it is in the UK, but circus culture is very contentious because of animal rights, for example. 
um, and also because of the weirdness of circus. So there was a lot of weird things that he showed us that we included in the site, but that most people would look at and go, this is deeply troubling. Um, we sort of left it to the people to look at it to say, this is troubling or not. Uh, a lot of the clowns that we worked with talked about a culture that is disappearing because of PETA and other groups that have basically shut them down. Because if you, you know, in other groups, I mean, they used to do things in the circus that were making fun of people um, that they don't do anymore. So they've basically made it less circusy. Something that Sarah said earlier on, which is really disturbing uh, in a different way, uh, which is. Um, <laughs> which is about the relationship between scholarly research and uh, academic capitalism and the idea that there's, there's just no way you can separate that. I mean, it's something as a new like, academic to this world, um, I've kind of seen it through the ref submission and uh, various different institutional procedures. But I mean, is it, is, is it really that bleak? You just <laughs> think there, you, that's it? Yeah, which, which doesn't mean that the, the sum of scholarship is something to do with monetization. But it, it's, I guess it's a, it's a way of saying how do we address that relation. And, and I felt that the, um, the, the Drucker piece addressed it in, in what was quite a classical way, really, which is to say, look, this thing is called scholarship is, is, is important to us historically. It's tied to certain uh, elements or, or institutions that, 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 that we find important including publishing, including uh, teaching and, and research. And, uh, you know, we have to protect it from the things that are happening and not get distracted <coughs> by pixel dust, you know? And she's absolutely right, you know, about the not getting distracted thing, because as I think you probably all agree, the solution does not lie in multimodality per se. It, it's not a solution to a problem, it's a strategy. It's a, it's a mode of working, it's a mode of, 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 of possibly exploring things like methods and what, you know, what we mean by it. So that's, it's, it's precisely that. It's saying, look, you know, what are the ways you can uh, uh, um, address this more responsibly and perhaps more actively is by, um, is by dealing with the trouble that we're in. <laughs> and we all know that the trouble we're, you know, the trouble we're in, uh, um, you know, the, the, the UK system has had to deal with it pretty quick, I think. Um, and it's been a bit shocking. Um, and so the tendency, I think, is to sort of split things. This is quite often, you know, you take a, I want to take it too, too much of a psychological <laughs> or psychoanalytic perspective. We do tend to hive things off. You know, we'll protect this thing called scholarship from this thing called capital. Well, they were never separate um, entirely. Um, they're, they're joined in particular ways right now. How do we want to act in the academy in relationship to, to the knowledge we produce and the practices of scholarship? whilst taking account of, it's, it's about taking account of and not pretending that we're untouched by or can be, you know, preserving something um, that in itself, in any case, is, is uh, you know, is historically contingent, was always part of a process of being involved in industry and, uh, uh, um, and, and utility and all, and all the rest of it. Can I just add to that? Because I, it, it really, um just brings to mind this example I, I, I very briefly showed earlier, the punishment preventive autotherapy. Uh, so this image of a person sitting on a chair with a bucket on his head. Um, so in a way, I think, uh, you know, I mean, this, this was all about play, right? You know, creating, if you, if, you, if you wish, places of otherness within which it's possible to play. Um, and I guess multimodality is, uh, is also a possibility to play as long as it doesn't become uh, part of the next ref that, you know, uh, you, you have to have 10, ten blog posts uh, uh, per person per year. Uh, otherwise, you're not a good academic. Um, no, but seriously, I mean, I think it's, it's, it's a little bit about experimenting also on ourselves as, um, as, as academic figures. Uh, and I quite like this this idea of thinking about the scholar and entre entrepreneur and think about how this can be, well, you know, to stay with the Foucauldian line, how could we be subjectified otherwise? 
uh, or not on not necessarily on these terms. So, can I ask how much is setting up these presses for everyone a way of you creating a space to play, and how much is that in the university? How much is it more? You know, you were talking about Sam and Stapp being more kind of non-professional. How much is that? Where's that working, and, and, and how's that the relationship to being? Uh, you know, because being entrepreneurial for a lot of our time in the university would have been seen as a bad thing and negative. And how much is that? How much are we able to play with that idea? Well, for sure, I'm, an, I'm a reluctant entrepreneur, um, but but here we are. I mean, just a little anecdote, I guess. Uh, um, just to when I when I went off to write the novel. It came very much out of feminist STS. It was the logical step from Haraway and Bredotti, right? It was just like, do it, do it, do it. Oh, I'll do it. okay, I'll do it. You know, I'm done. I'll just somebody's got to go. Um, you know, and, and that came out of partly out of frustration with the uh, severe limitations of communication in, inside the academy. If you're, you know, playing the game, you're producing articles and monographs for uh, for university presses. It's very delimiting, um, very very constraining in terms of the kinds of uh, of knowledge you're able to produce for me too constraining so off I go and I I think okay I'll be a novelist then I'll, I'll do experimental fiction okay just how restricting was that process uh, trade fiction um, it was you, you know it, restriction doesn't even come into it it's it's uh, it, it's it's rationale is uh, hugely hugely instrumentalized uh, and marketized now so yes this is a very fascinating piece of experiment um, please make it more ordinary uh, no, that's not ordinary enough. Do it again. That's not quite ordinary enough. Do it again. Do it again. Do it again. Do it again. Um, so, r running back to the academy, and and then finding the, if you like, a little bit of in-between space, publishing a, um, um, an issue of Culture Machine, uh, which Joanna and I could do bad things to because we were editing it. Um, you find the little nooks and crannies, right? It's it comes down to nooks and crannies. It comes down to fault lines. It comes down to um, um, having it just about enough clout to find a bit of space, a little bit of space to mess around in. Um, and it was, it was never going to be as clean as making a break from this or from that thing. And the press idea uh, is completely tied to, for me, it's a political project. It is about what, I, what can I do from where I am to uh, open the possibilities for other, for myself, but probably not for me directly. It's unlikely that I would submit to my own editorial board, who will, by the way, be very frightening, I should imagine. Um, but <laughs> you know, what, what, kinds of, what kinds of spaces can I make? Um, and knowing that that's, um, th that's very hard, it's like kind of a privilege to be able to, to, to do it, and it will be compromised, and it will play the other game always, and, and has to in order to be viable, in order to be financially viable, in order to work within an institution that is, you know, where we are right now. So, uh, you know, who knows? It, it starts off um, um, with its ideals, and, and there's no point in, in just it being an idealistic project. It's a political project. It's where's the space? How can I make it? How can I, how can I find it? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, and that's, that resonates very strongly with, with our experience, and I think <laughs> the importance is... is um, about creating spaces and spaces not in opposition to, but within uh, <coughs> an, an academic environment. And what I, what I find really astounding is that so far, no one really has said no to us. So we've we've also assembled quite a frightening editorial board. Um, we've uh, commissioned a, a, a couple of um, manuscripts. We asked reviewers to review it and add th their names uh, to it. So to do open review, no, not a single person said no. Uh, and I think that this is this this indicates that um, even though not many people are actively engaged in experimentation themselves. When someone comes with an idea, um, sometimes they are just happy to say yes. And, and Craig, that seems to relate to your idea of kit bashing, and it's like people are kit bashing the university to make it do something more interesting and fun. And Yes, exactly. Um, I, I was struck by Sarah's phrase early on, uh, which was, um, 
the spectacular display of productivity. So on the one hand, that's the one sort of thing that we're trying to avoid in some ways. On the other hand, that is always a threat. If, if you're just starting out in academia and you think it's bleak, that's, that's the bleakness, the spectacular display of productivity. So what's happening in the United States around this is people are kit bashing, if you will, um, all of these models. So for example, Punctum Books uh, and Punctum Records uh, was started by one person, Eileen Joy. Uh, she was an academic in uh, the middle of the country, uh, which was very flat and uh, literally and figuratively. And so she, um, she quit. She had a tenured position at um, the University of Southern Illinois and she quit. And instead what she did is she set up Punctum Books and she uh, sells these pamphlet length books uh, that cost about $9 each, nine or $10 each. Um, and they're print on demand and she's published in a year and a half, she's published uh, 60 books and now it's up, I think up to 70 books and she started a record label and she started a bunch of journals. This reminds me a lot of what Mattering Press is doing um, and in some ways um, could be the, uh, I went, and I mentioned this to an academic friend of mine, he said that's both thrilling and terrifying. So for those just starting out in academia, that's sort of the thing that I think this panel has been about is on the one hand, it's really exciting. On the other hand, it's terrifying. And, you know, and the, so that's one model. Another model is Helen Burgess uh, started Hyperrise and uh, is the technical editor of another journal called Rhizomes, um, rhizomes.net. And um, in both of these journals, um, they're my friends. And what they said to me is, just do it. Just go out and just start your own whatever it is. And, and in fact, that's what I'm being encouraged to do is to start a press myself and just do what and, and not have anything to do with the university. So but I kill, continue to think that the university press model is one that we should occupy. That is, we shouldn't just sit there and go, well, that's that that we can't play in that in that circus. Instead, what I'm arguing is that we need to start university presses. So I, I hope that you will start one. Uh, I, and the mechanism here has been somewhat mystifying. I just keep doing it and the administrators go, well, that's very exciting. They haven't given me any money, but they can't really say no to me because they haven't given me the funding yet. So in that sense, we're just open to start something. And at some point, I guess they might shut me down, but they haven't yet. That's fantastic. I think that's a really great place to end because we're going to go for uh, we're going to go for a spot of tea and some more sugar intake and I'm going to go and check out the perverted miniature circuses online <laughs> um, I'd like to thank the person who's to Craig's left who we haven't actually seen uh, is there someone there I don't know who that is but I'd like to thank them uh, I'd like to thank you guys for uh, kind of bearing with the technology in this uh, larger experiment and of course our three speakers that was fantastic we will we'll be back at uh, 4.30, so you've got 20 minutes, that's it, to stock up on your sugar and everything. Thanks a lot. Thank you, sir. Thank you.